I remember being in a schoolyard and another student said to me, Simon, if you stop using your voice for more than a minute, you're going to lose your voice forever. And so this developed a, an obsessive thought in my mind that this was going to happen. And so I started performing this compulsive behavior. So the C and OCD of humming to myself all day, every day for about two years. Welcome back to You Need a Counselor podcast. My name is Julie Johnson. I am the president and founder here at Heart and Solutions. You can contact us if you are in Iowa looking for mental health counseling services by telehealth or in any of our six office locations. And I'm Krista Hunt. I am the vice president at Heart and Solutions in charge of the BHIS department. So BHIS stands for Behavioral Health Intervention Services. And that's where we go in home and work with children four through 18 years old on different behavioral skills. And we can also see them in the office or on telehealth as well. And this is our podcast, You Need a Counselor. So we are designed for people curious about counseling, but have barriers keeping them from experiencing the benefits of counseling. Our mission is to share stories about counseling, good, bad, and indifferent, and spread the message that everyone can benefit from mental health and behavioral health counseling services. So we post on Sunday nights, central time. Um, So our hope is that you will join us in doing whatever unpleasant task you hate doing, putting away laundry, cooking your meals for the week, uh, practicing, getting your miles in on the treadmill, whatever it is you hate doing, batch up that task and join us on Sunday nights. You can listen to the podcast that gives you that entire week to get in touch with either one of our guests from the show or get in touch with your own counselor if you haven't seen them in a while. All right, so today we've got a guest uh, coming to us from the other side of the world. We've got a guest from Australia today. Um, So we've got Simon Rennie here with us today. Um, He is the owner of Mindful Men and the host of the Mindful Men podcast. Um, Mindful Men is a private practice uh, where he does counseling for, oh my goodness, all kinds of people (laughs) out there at Mindful Men. Um, So we're very, very excited to have Simon here with us today. Hi, Simon. Thanks for being here. G'day. How are you going? Thanks so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this chat. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So tell us about Mindful Men, your private practice, Mindful Men. What, what, was it that uh, got you interested in starting a practice like yours? Yeah, so Mindful Men is a, a dedicated mental health therapy business and also disability um, capacity building business for, for men. Um, and I choose men and I niche down on men because I, I myself have lived with mental illness for 30 years, for over 30 years. And, and it started for me when I was eight years old with developing obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, bouts of depression, anxiety. And even burnout as well in 2020, I experienced burnout in my former career. And, and so I've always been passionate about men, uh, mental health, but particularly men's mental health and, and breaking down that social construct that guys can't talk and guys shouldn't talk and guys shouldn't feel emotions and all that type of stuff. So, so that's what I really do. I, I help guys break that down and open up and, and get vulnerable and become mindful of who they are. Absolutely. What are some of the challenges specific to men? Um, gosh, I mean, there are so many that I can think of in our society. What are some of those ones that the people that you work with are facing? Yeah, so a lot of it is is around, you know, relationships is a, is a key one is like how they're showing up in relationships with their partner or, or maybe a relationship at work or, or things like that. Um, a lot of it comes down to identity as well like who we are as guys like I work with a lot of dads and I'm a dad myself and and so like trying to connect with kids if we don't really have that connection or maybe it's we've lost connection through I guess challenges in a in a family relationship as well so that's kind of some of the work I do and and I think a lot of it stems from this notion that guys can't talk and we've bottled things up for so long and we we really don't know how to process negative emotions as they come into our body or things like anger. I mean, if you just look at anger alone, um, two, two stats really stick out for me is, is in Australia, we have like nine deaths by suicide every year or every day, sorry. And 75% of those are male. And then when we look at family and domestic violence data, men are overwhelmingly the perpetrators of family and domestic violence by the data. 
And that's telling me that we struggle to open up and talk about things and process anger and emotions and negativity in our minds. And if we can just learn to open up, maybe that data would come down, those stats will come down and we won't see as many men in troublesome situations. When it comes to uh, to completed suicides, um, my goodness, it is so overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly male. And, uh, and the link uh, between isolation and uh, and completed suicides is such a strongly uh, registered link. Um, and so what you're saying about not having those outlets with communication and relationship mm. building and uh, mending conflict, right, or, or surviving conflict uh, in, and having the relationship continue to be healthy. Um, these are challenging things, I think, uh, across the board. But um, but like you said, the data does show that uh, it is more uh, men do find themselves in these situations where they're not culturally uh, taught how to do this. And, yeah. uh, and there are far fewer role models for men um, when it comes to expressing our feelings and expressing mm-hmm. our needs and relationships um, in, in a healthy, non-aggressive way. Yeah. Very, very yeah. difficult. And so you, you grew up and you mentioned that when you starting at the age of eight, you started to have these symptoms of OCD and depression and anxiety. How did you, what kinds of symptoms were you noticing at that young age? And, and what did you do about those symptoms at the time? Yeah. So I grew up in the eighties and nineties in, in a land before smartphones and, and broadband internet and all this type of stuff. So my notion of how I understood the world was really influenced by the people around me. And, and, you know, I lived with three brothers and my dad in the household and we played a lot of sports. So I played Australian rules football, which is a very brutal sport, you know, getting hit by all, you know, all angles and all sides. And there's no padding here in Australia as well. Like, like you might have in the NFL over there. And, and so like everything I knew about being a boy was around being tough and being hard and being masculine and, and boys don't cry. You've got to suck it up and move on and that type of stuff. And then when I, so leading up until eight years old, mum always said I was like a pretty happy to go lucky kid. Nothing really fazed me. But then I remember being in a schoolyard and another student said to me, Simon, if you stop using your voice for more than a minute, you're going to lose your voice forever. And so this developed a, an obsessive thought in my mind that this was going to happen. And so I started performing this compulsive behavior. So the C and OCD of humming to myself all day, every day for about two years, because I was absolutely petrified of losing my voice. And and I would do it so quietly that nobody ever picked up that I was humming to myself. And I'd do it when people weren't watching. And and it was a very much of a silent thing. But growing up in the 80s and 90s, I didn't know this was mental illness because we never talked about it. Like nobody, I don't even know if it was in a diff, in a dictionary where I grew up. You know, it wasn't part of our vocabulary. And And so like most people, I bottled it up and I kept it to myself and I didn't know how to express it because I didn't know what was going on. And and it developed over time and it got really bad in my teenage years. And and particularly the teenage years is when the depression really came in is we, mum and and dad split up and my little brother and I moved out with mum. And so I became that man of the house. And and I remember this overwhelming fear of safety and needing to be secure. And so I would spend literally hours each night you know, worried about someone breaking into the house and and stealing our stuff or hurting us or kidnapping us or or even the house burning down while we slept. So I would perform these compulsive behaviours of checking the house for hours on end and I'd go and touch the door certain ways and windows certain ways and I've got to have the curtains pulled in a certain way and, and, you know, checking the oven was off and stove was off, all these things. And just with this overwhelming fear of something bad happening in our sleep. And, and that's particularly when the depression came in. It was like, I'm so exhausted of doing this every night or every day. Even when I was leaving the house, I'd have to, you know, do a quick lap. And um, it also developed to when I got my, my driver's license into, you know, making sure that the, the handbrake was, was really on because I was worried the car would roll down a hill and kill a whole bunch of people just you know through that act and 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 OCD stuck with me you know I'm 39 now and I'm still live with it and um but yeah certainly in those teenage years I started to recognize I was really down I still didn't know what depression was I still didn't know what OCD was 
And in fact, it wasn't until I was 28. So I lived for 20 years like this, wow. bottled it up until I finally got that inspiration from my now wife to go and see a doctor and say, I think I've got mental health issues. So um, it certainly evolved over the years, but it took a long time to come out and come to terms with what it is. And it's 10 years this year that I've been on this recovery journey, um, but only really the last 12 months or two years that I've actually been talking about it in the open like I do today. Yeah, absolutely. Just the the accessibility sometimes when we're that age, it, there is none. <laughs> and so that that common line of thought of, well, that's just, that's a me problem, right? Like that's mm. who I am. That's a problem with me um, because there's no us, right? There's no people who suffer from OCD. There's, I, I'm having this issue. It's a me thing. Um, it because of that isolation uh, can just can be so so painful and it feels like there is no way out sometimes um, and you know with depressive symptoms that that expectation and then reality right and it, a lot of times expectation of ourselves right I have to keep the family safe by doing all of these things mm. I need to make sure that nothing bad happens to the people that I love by doing all of these things and I can't possibly be doing them. 24 hours a day to make sure that there isn't a moment in between where something horrible happens. And yeah. so having that, that be our reality, and especially in those young formative ages and not having any support or anybody to say, there are things we can do, we can help with this. Um, absolutely. I mean, it, it makes sense why you, and it, it's very admirable that you're taking what you've now learned over the last 10 years, and especially over the last 12 months and sharing that with other people in your situation. Because if one eight-year-old can hear your podcast, can hear Mindful Men, <laughs> right? And and is uh, is looking forward to growing up to be a man, right? And, uh, and can hear that and know, okay, I'm not the only boy experiencing <laughs> these things. Um, I mean, what a difference that makes, even if it's one one young yeah. person yeah and even if it's a 38 or a 48 or 58 year old mm -hmm. who's been like oh, i've got to bottle this up and and you mentioned isolation a few times and it's so true like we had COVID isolation so we were isolated from the world but even like when you live with mental illness and particularly for guys it, you, you often feel like you're wearing too much you're a mask you know you've got the external you which is the one that nobody knows what's going on but the internal you is something that is very isolating because like you said like you feel like you've got no outlet you don't know how to talk about it. I mean, mental health has only been in my vocabulary for the last 10 years or so, maybe a little bit longer. Um, so for, for all those guys, that for generations before me who have just sucked it up and use alcohol, drugs, you know, suicide as outlets, um, yeah, hopefully they can hear this today and, and, and maybe step on their own recovery pathway. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What are some of the things that you've been able to learn about your own systems and the way the way that you see the world that you've been able to share with others that might be in a similar situation? Yeah, so I think going and talking to someone was the hardest thing I ever did. Like going to see that GP 10 years ago was really difficult. And I, and I kind of knew a couple of years earlier that I needed to do something like that. But the shame and stigma associated with taking medications was what held me back. I didn't want to be someone who was on medications every day because um, my mum was on medications every day. And I thought, like, yeah, that's not a life that I want to live. But I didn't really know any any other way. And so I self-medicated with alcohol. Um, I numbed the pain. It numbed the thoughts that were going through my mind and just slow things down and give me moments of, of just quiet in, in an evening, for example. But once I did that, it just every time I started talking from that point and from that doctor's appointment, things got easier. Um, and the first few times I went to counseling, you know, it didn't, I got the diagnosis, which was really helpful because for me, knowledge is power. And once you know what's going on, and a lot of people say that they're not defined by their mental illness, but I, I really think that it certainly does help understand what's going on, how your brain works and how your body works as well. And from there, like I, I trialed different types of therapies, a lot of CBT. Um, it felt like homework and I wasn't really in the mood for homework at that time. I just kind of wanted to get it out there. And I, I actually thought that a therapist would just wave a magic wand and, and cure me. 
and it do- doesn't work then <laughs> that does not work and and um and so yeah i've tried different medications over the years and it's it's it is a discovery pathway like you got to find the right stuff that works for you like it's whether the medication like there was some that i lost my sexual drive i put on heaps of weight they were just making me really lethargic there was one that was really good but it knocked me out for 12 hours pretty much i'd be asleep within half an hour and and when i became a dad that just became impossible to maintain um because i needed to be up during the night if the kids kids were up as well so it is a bit of a trial and error process but I think one of the best things that happened to me was actually my burnout situation. So in 2020, I experienced burnout. Um, I'd been juggling full-time work for a 15-year career in a public service in a, in a high KPI environment. Um, I was studying my Master's of Social Work as well, part-time. So in the evenings, on the weekends, we had the two kids under three or four, and then we had COVID as well. And and um, I burnt out completely physically, mentally, emotionally. I was just spent and... And from that, I found um, I got, you know, started learning more about OCD and, and perfectionism and how perfectionism really fuels that and then how that's influenced my burnout situation. And then from the burnout situation, I started entering into the mindfulness space. And that's where Mindful Men comes from. It's, it's this concept around grounding ourselves and using our five senses to, to be in the moment because my brain will be on four different planets at the same time. Like I really struggled to be where my feet are. Uh, and particularly, I noticed this particularly as a dad, you know, my kids could be talking to me and I'll be on a different planet. My wife's like, Simon, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, they're talking to you, but I'm not with them. So through mindfulness, I've been able to like, and it's particularly acceptance of commitment therapy is really honing in where, where my feet are. And and I love that one particularly because it also helps us tune into our values and, and values aren't something that a lot of people think about and, and, and reflect on, but for guys, it's particularly useful because it also tune, you know, when we know our values, we know those things that make us feel good because we often lose the joy and, and we stop experiencing happiness and being creative. Like the guitar sat there for too long. I need to dust it off soon and, and play it again. And, and from there, we can start to really tune into our pure identity and, and the identity that we want to have, not the one that we've been living on an autopilot for 30 years. So um, so from that perspective, we can become mindful of who we are as people and, and how that shows up in our work and in our lives and as our in our roles as parents and so forth. And, and so f- for me, mindfulness has been a huge thing to help me with the the OCD, the depression, the anxiety. Um, but I also have done a bit of exposure response prevention for OCD particularly. Um, and that was, was really good in terms of being able to control the behaviours and take more control over the thoughts that happen with OCD as well. So can you tell us for our listeners, tell us more about that and what that is and what that process was like for you? The exposure response prevention? Yeah, so I didn't actually know ERP, so it's called ERP, and, and it was around until I started my Instagram account for Mindful Men, and, and I found this, this world of OCD people, this community that I never knew existed. You know, I thought OCD is not something, when we talk about mental illness, we don't talk about OCD, we talk about depression, mm-hmm. usually. Um, and, and so finding this community, I was like, oh, wow, there's so many more people like me out there, and and they were all talking about ERP and I'm like, oh, what's ERP? I've only ever heard of cognitive behavioral therapy before. And it turns out ERP is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. But instead of focusing so much on the thoughts, which is what I did in my first few versions of therapy, I was focusing on the thoughts and thought diaries and all that type of stuff. We focus more on the behavior and trying to prevent the behavior. Um and so there's a bit of an element of mindfulness in there. It's, it, it's accepting the thoughts as they come into our bodies, but really trying to put in strategies to avoid the behavior. So, for example, one of the ones that we did was for my car, so the, the idea of the car rolling down a hill um, and killing everybody. So that's the thought. And so the, my usual behavior would be to check the car. You know, is the, is the handbrake on? Is it flat? Is, you know is it possible that it could roll down? So sometimes I'd park it in a spot where if it does roll down, if it crashes into something, that thing is not going to be a person. It's usually going to be like a wall or a tree or something like that. So I'm already doing this when I'm parking the car. But we, what we did was 
we we purposely and it was lucky that the car was on a flat surface in the car park so it wasn't going to roll down a hill but just the thought of me taking off the handbrake and so i was doing this with my psychologist and we took off the handbrake and we walked away from the car about 20 meters so we're still in the same location as the car and one of the one of the behaviors is also to me to turn and look at the car and make sure that it's not rolling down so we deliberately looked away from the car so we've taken the handbrake off I'm looking away from the car my anxiety is starting to rise and rise and rise and rise and and so it, the process is it's a very simple process it, it is just like sitting with the rise of the anxiety and and the the intrusive thoughts that are coming through that the car is going to roll down and kill everybody and then waiting for that peak and then noticing when the peak happens and that it starts to come down and then rating out like rating that response in our body like okay this gave me 10 out of 10 of anxiety. And then the next time it gave me nine out of 10, eight out of 10, seven and so forth until we can get it to a manageable level. So that was a really basic tool that we used um, to, to deliberately expose myself to the trigger and then avoid the response and do this repeated, like do it over and over and over again to build almost like the muscle memory in your body and your brain that, you know, you can sit through that and, and live through that and bad things won't happen if you don't do a, B, C. So um, that's probably the easiest way to, to to reflect on it. We did do some some virtual reality stuff. So we put on a headset because I've got a bit of social anxiety and I, I was sitting on a train and with the virtual reality thing, which was really cool, didn't quite work for me because I've grown up playing video games. So I knew it wasn't real. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, but that's a, another cool way you could do it. Um, but a lot of my my triggers happen at night time, so it would be unusual for a therapist to be in my house to do ERP with me. Um, but like we we're doing things like like when I with OCD, I do a lot of things in order, so things have to be done like one, two, three, four, five, for example. And so one of the tricks that we used was was changing that order, so going one, two, five, four, three. And just changing the way that we did the order so that it can take more control over my behavior by saying, no, I don't have to do it in order. And so that was a cool thing. Um, and then one day we were able to eliminate one of the numbers. So one, two, four, five, and number three was gone. Um, and, and just work on that every night, do, do the same and, and slowly become more comfortable with not having to do everything so perfect and, and so, such an order. And I mean, I still live with this. It's, it's an ongoing th process, but these are some of the, the ways ERP can particularly combat things like OCD as well. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, they're, one of the main challenges with CBT is that it it starts with the cognitive um, and with OCD, th these are uncontrollable racing thoughts. Um, and so if we don't have control over the thoughts, we can't change, we can't go at it through cognition, mm. um, but we can change our behavior. I can say, okay, I'm not going to put my hand on the door. I'm not going to, I'm going to take my hand off of the handbrake um, and we can go at it that way. And because they're all connected, um, they, it, it works in reverse as well. Um, yeah. and so, uh, how beautiful and, you know, I, what keeps coming to my mind since you do work with men and there is such a, uh, a, a stigma around men having to be strong, right. And not wanting to show weakness through, uh, through working through their mental health. And what keeps coming to my mind is how much strength and bravery, it takes to do something like take your hand off the handbrake um, mm. and to actually feel that feeling um, and all those thousands of feelings that all come at once when our bodies do something that it's like, wait, that's not, <laughs> I'm not safe now. Right. And, um, and being able to sit with that feeling of like, well, now I don't feel safe because I didn't do the thing. Um, takes so much bravery and so yeah. much strength yeah. so much more than um than the other ways that we can cope with our our mental health 
uh, symptoms, which is like you talked about alcohol and, mm. and drugs and, you know, social media and all of those, you know, YouTube videos, whatever it is, um, the things that we do to kind of distract ourselves, because we don't want to go through that very painful process of feeling the feelings. And, um, and it takes a lot of strength to do that and to do it on purpose, especially to ourselves, right? Why would we do that to ourselves? Um, but it, it takes a lot of strength to do it because we yeah. know that it is going to help us in the long run. Um, and so I, I love that, you know, these things that you're working with and especially the mindfulness concept, because, um, you know, a lot of times our brains will, will disassociate to other things because it's painful to be in the present moment. If I've got social anxiety and I'm on the bus next to another person, like, where is my phone and, or yeah. where is my book? Because it's painful to sit there and think about, should I make eye contact with that person? Like, did I, did they say hi back to me when I said hi, should I not have said that? Right. Like yeah. all of those thoughts that we have, if I sit on the bus next to another person with social anxiety it is, it is much easier to be like, where's my phone? Let me read some article about, you know, some recipe or something. Mm. Um, and it takes so much strength to be mindful and to sit with that feeling of like, I don't feel safe and I can, I cannot feel safe and still be safe at mm. the same time. Right. And it, it takes a while for some, for a lot of us to, know that. And we, we can say, I can be safe even when I don't feel safe. We can say that all day long, but to be able to feel it and experience it and for our bodies to be able to go, okay, I took my hand off the emergency brake one time and my car didn't roll down the hill and kill somebody, right? Like I, I did that one time I sat on the bus next to a stranger without my phone and without my book. And it was okay. Like, yeah. It was fine. Um, and having those experiences to draw from just so important. So I love that you are sharing these. Um, I mean, you call it a mindfulness journey and a lot of times people call it that, but this really physically is like a trek for you <laughs> that you're going <laughs> on and, um, and that you're, you're inviting other men to join on this trek. Um, it, it is very, very cool. I mean, working through our own mind, it is the ultimate full contact sport. It really is <laughs> like, it is painful in a way that, uh, yeah, I mean, gosh, Australian football without pads is painful. <laughs> that, that's a painful thing to do. Um, but there's benefit to doing it. Right. And, uh, and same thing with, you know, tackling our mental health, uh, concerns and symptoms and really digging in and going like, okay, I'm going to rip off a bandaid here and mm -hmm. I'm going to feel what it feels like to let my depressive thoughts talk to me, right. Without doing something to block them out. And we're just going to let them, I'm just going to let them say what they're going to say. And they're yeah. not pleasant. I don't like them, but, <laughs> but being able to let them talk, right. And let, and hear them and know that, okay, my depression, my anxiety can be saying to me, you are worthless. You are terrible. Nobody likes you, right? Everything's about to blow up in your life. Those things can be happening in my head and I can still be safe. And safety yeah. has been such a thread in everything that you've been talking about. It's such a basic human need. And uh, I think for men, societally, even more so because you have, as, as men, right, we have the we have that basic need to feel safe, but then also like feeling responsible for the safety, mm. not only of ourselves, yeah. but for others. Um, and you talked about how, you know, some of those changes that happened when you were a parent, there's a similarity there, right? For any kind, for any parent where, you know, yeah, I had a lot of challenges with safety <laughs> before I was a parent. And then as soon as I was a parent, it's like, oh no, I got to keep this one safe. <laughs> too, right? <laughs> I got to be safe. I got to keep this one going. Um, it's, you know, but for men, that's kind of ingrained in, in you, even before you're a parent, right? You take care of your mother, take care of your sibling, take care of everybody around you. Um, and, and it is a challenge. And I'm so glad that you're out there um, spreading this message that men can use mindfulness, that men mm. can be men <laughs> and be manly and 
have great mental health and be actively working on their mental health. Yeah. Awesome. So if somebody wants to, now somebody uh, listening can find you on the Mindful Men podcast, um, Mm -hmm. but how do they find you if they want to be involved with the services that you're providing at Mindful Men? Yeah, so it's open as a, an Australian social worker. We're only licensed for for working in Australia as social workers. So um, yeah, they can just access me through www.mindful-men.com.au, and that's got my services on there and what I do. And I do that telehealth Australia wide. So for example, I'm on the east coast, and this week, next week, I've got a client who's on the west coast. So a three hour time difference. So that's really cool. Um, but also, yeah, in person on the Sunshine Coast, um, just give me a call or an email and we can w- arrange a time and a place. So I don't have a, a ongoing full-time clinic. I actually like to take um, therapy out of a clinic space and, and meet people in their homes or or do walk and talk. Or We've got lots of amazing beaches and, and, and nature here. So if you want to go do some mindfulness outside, that's that's what I like to do is because a lot of guys don't like to sit in a room and, and talk about things because it's too clinical. Um, so I like to do that. Um, but the website's also got my social media as well. So I've got the Mindful Men podcast that you can access, which is me having this discussion with with people across the world. And, and it's great to do that because you hear, even though we might be separated by a huge ocean, we're going through very similar things. So it's nice to hear that these things are global issues as well. Um, and I've also got Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, where I share a lot of that kind of content and a lot of little daily affirmations. Daily affirmations have become a good thing for me to to feel pepped up as well, and and I really enjoy them. So yeah, that, that's probably the website's the best place to to link in with all of that resources. Wonderful, mindful men and the mindful men podcast. So um, I think it's wonderful. There are so many men that have, there There are so many barriers to mental health care to begin with, uh, but for men and for especially um, OCD, uh, there mm. are, when you talked about getting the diagnosis and feeling kind of a sense of relief, like, oh, we have this, <laughs> like, there's other people that have, like, we have this. It's yeah. not a me thing. I mean, um, what a relief sometimes there is in that. Um, and I love that you shared too. I think you're, you're a great role model for the medication discussion because, uh, you, you tried medications that didn't work for your phase of life that didn't work for, uh, for your lifestyle. And and then you tried new ones until you found, Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that worked for you. And I, I think that that can be such a barrier for people, but I think that you're, you're such a great example of like, keep trying it like give that feedback to your doctor (laughs) keep telling them like oh this one works but it's i can't be asleep for 12 hours at a time like i'm a new dad um and keep telling them that because that gets you closer and closer every time um to the combination that's going to work for you so um so thank you so much for being on today Mm -hmm. simon this has been great I'm Simon Rini and I need a counsellor, but I'm also a counsellor as well. So it's okay for therapists to be in therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh my gosh. I need one. So does Krista. And we're all counsellors and we need a counsellor. <laughs> That's, <for, laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here, Simon. This is great. Uh, we will link all of Simon's social media links as well in the show notes of this uh, episode here. Um, If you are in Iowa and the United States um, and you're looking for therapy or in-home behavioral health intervention, give us a call at 800-531-4236. And like Julie mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we post new episodes every Sunday at 5 p.m. Central Time. So save up whatever task you hate doing. Listen to us at the same time while you get that done and we can help convince you to reach out to a counselor or to call your current counselor and get set up with services that week as well. And if you have any questions for us, you can reach us on You Need a Counselor Podcast on Instagram or You Need a Counselor Podcast on Facebook as well. And I'm Krissa Hunt. And I'm Julie Johnson. And we need a counselor. And so do you. Bye. Bye.